Hi, welcome to Go on the Run. And today we're going to look at how to talk to MongoDB from GoLang. Now, if you remember the last time we didn't write any code, we simply look at how to download MongoDB, install it, get it running, and then connect it from the MongoDB shell. That's all part of MongoDB. You didn't have to use any Go. And with the MongoDB shell, we sort of played around with like inserting a, you know, creating a database, inserting collection into a database, and then inserting some documents into a collection, querying it, counting it, that sort of stuff, the typical kind of thing you would really want to do if you're trying to write an application. Now we want to see how to do that sort of thing from Go application, because that's what we care about, right? Is how do we access and use these things from Go? All right, so I have a few examples. So that should help us move a little bit faster um, instead of you see me typing. So let's get started. Package I'm going to be using is this global sign mgo package. Now, let me give you some history. So if you go to go.org and you type like Mongo, you know, or M MongoDB or something like that, MongoDB, um, some of the packages that come up, as you can see, there's this go package that in Mongo version two. So I know of this package for some time now, um, sometime about last year when it's actually being maintained, but, um, or before, I don't even remember, but it's been a while. But when I went back to it now, um, the maintainer signed that out, well, this is no longer maintained. And if you click on this link to go and see why, the reason I'm walking through all this is I wanna tell you why I end up using the package I'm using. All right, so let's go back to the application to the co some coding. All right, so let's start with a very simple example. So the first thing, so what I'll do is I'll copy the code from here because um, if I copy it and paste it in this file, then we can see easily what's changing. Okay, so the first thing I think we should try to do is say, let's see if we can connect to our MongoDB server. And so that looks pretty straightforward. We're keeping it simple since we're testing our machine. And I just want to connect to a MongoDB server that's running locally. I import uh, MGO um, package. And the way you use it is you say dial and you give it a URL. So this pretty much looks like if you're using the net package with like net that dial, but you give it the URL and it returns to you a session. And of course, if there's an error, so we check if there's an error. And that basically means if we can't connect to our MongoDB server, well, there's nothing else for us to do. So we fatal and that's going to exit our program. If we can connect, I defer closing the session because you must clean up. So make sure to tell you close your session. And this is one of the best way. That's why I like one of the things I really like with Go is that when we know that we get a valid object that needs to clean up, we can arrange for it to be closed regardless of how we exit the application. And if we are connected, I look successfully. And because we have already default closing, when our program ends, we're going to close up, clean up. So let's run this and see. So here I am. Um, so I need some in my MongoDB directory already. Um, so I can say go run. I think I have everything in the command directory. So there we go. I'll try run it. Now notice when you rose in go module, your run command might take a little time. And that's because um, it's, download it might have to go and download those packages that you don't have remember you don't have to say anything like install packages if you actually want to see what's going on you can do like um let me go to the command directory here and i say can say go build for example and if i do that then um if it wasn't downloading but it's already downloaded it so um i don't have to worry about it but yeah but that's why it was taking so long so okay so the time I told it can't reach my server. Also, it was trying for a while, so it couldn't reach my server. Well, the reason it can't reach my server is, is because, well, I have to run my server. So I'm not going to go through this again, but this is the command I'm going to use to run the installation of MongoDB that I have installed locally. And so now that's running and waiting for connection. I will go back here and I'm using the default port, so I don't need to do anything fancy. And so let me rerun my code again. So clean up, go run main, and notice how it says successfully connected to the database. 
that's all we wanted to be able to do in this simple example. So let's try doing some other things like listing how many databases are in um, our server that we have, you know, defined in our server. So let's see, what have we changed? Um, well, format in, okay, fine. We, we're using the FMT package now. And so we're still doing DAL and all that stuff. Still nothing changed there. What we've tacked on is now that we have a session, because once we've reached this point, we know we have a session, we can ask for the databases. And we did this on the command line too, right? When we connected to MongoDB shell, we were able to find a list of all the databases. And so we want to do that. And this is going to return a slice of strings. And you could look up the documentation. Um, so, you know, if you go global signs, and then you look up session, Oh, where is it? Um, oh, this is not, I don't want to be sun just yet. I don't know why I clicked on that, but anyway. So we're looking at session and oh, where's session? Yep, there it is. So if you call dial, you get back a session pointer and on that session, you can now call database names and this returns to your list of databases. And notice you can also call database to connect to a specific database. So we're gonna use that very soon. But we get back a list of databases and if we get back an error, we print out a warning and, you know, we try to iterate, but if this is nil, no big deal, you know. Um, we just wanna print out our error to know what it is. But so we know that Go takes care of like an empty slice. So, all right, so let's run this and see what we get. So if we run this now, ah, look at that so we know we can connect successfully but uh, these are our databases and I just decided to print it out with the number and you know sort of write justified blah 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 um, but so we have our admin config local and a to do's database if you remember when we were playing with this from the command line so let's see what which collections do we have in our to do's database so we can have multiple collection in our database all right, so if you look at what's changed, I have added the ability, now that we, from our previous example, we were able to list our databases. So now that we know which databases we have, well, and which one we want to use, we can pass that on the command line. So I just use os.arg to check and see if, if it's just one, the length of os.arg means it's just a program name, okay? Um, if you haven't used OS.arg yet, do check it out, but I can make a video about that. Leave a comment and we can play with OS.arg. It ties in nicely with the flag package. So I'll do a video on that. Um, so anyway, um, I look if there's just one argument, that means you didn't provide a database name, I'll use the test database because usually when you connect from the Mongo shell, the, if you don't specify a, a database to connect to, it connects to like the test database. And so otherwise I use the database that you specify. And then of course we still do the same thing of dialing and connecting, but know that we know that for session, you can say session.db to get connect to a specific database. So you get back a database. If I have a valid database, now I can say database that collection names to give me all the collections in that specific database. And then of course, if I can't get the collections, then you know, big deal warn about it, but I still iterate. And if that's nil, no big deal. If otherwise I can list those collection. So let's do that. Let's do go run. And this time let's pro provide a collection name that I know is not there. Um, let's call it test. And so there we go. Test collection is empty. We didn't see it in the list. Let's call it test two. See, no collection. But remember all uh, MongoDB works as once you try to connect to a database anyway, um, it, it's not there, not collection, um, test database. So, okay, so that's nothing there. And then there was the admin database that we saw. Um, so, yep, that has a collection. We saw local, I think, was another um, collection we saw. And the one we're really interested in is to-dos. And so in our to-dos collection, we had a collection named task, we only had one collection. So now that we can list all the collections in a database, and here we specify the database, of course now we want to list all the documents in that collection. 
So let's do that. So let's go back here. Let's see what's changed. So we can get a database. So in this case is our to-do database. We know which collection we want. So what I'll do instead is since we can iterate over all the collection, why not get all the collection and iterate over all the documents in each collection? So what I'll do is, this is pretty much the same code we had from before, except when I'm iterating over the collection, I'll call this function list doc where I pass it the database and the collection name. And so that allows me now to get from the database the specific collection that I want, which is specified here, and then I will list all the documents in it. Now, the way you, once you have a collection, right? So you say database that give me this specific collection. Um, once you have the collection, you can say things like find, count, and a number of other methods you can call. And of course you can go back to this. Um, so we have a database. So once we get a database, now we can ask for database that collection. And so given the string, we get back a collection. So now that we have a collection, um, we can call things like bulk, um, count, create, and a whole bunch of other things, right? You can drop things, find things, all this other good stuff. And so we're using find, which returns a query. Now find takes a query itself, um, which is basically, you could think of it as the, an example of what you're looking for. So a document that describes what you're looking for, the fields you want to return, what value should you have, and so on. And I suggest that you read this, but we'll keep it simple. And you could see one for iterate or tail. There's all those things you can do once you have a query. But for us, we will just simply, for that query, call all. And when you call all, what you do is specify somewhere to store the result. And so this should be a slice, a pointer to a slice. And it tells you in the documentation that it should be a pointer. Some way down at the bottom, it tells you it should be a pointer, so a slice. So um, that's exactly what I'll do. So let's get back to the code. So you can see I have result is a slice of interface. I'll start off with this first, because let's pretend that this is our first time connecting to some MongoDB database. We don't know what is the structure of those documents, and we want to sort of discover. So we write in this example as a way of discovering that data. And so we first figure out to connect, make sure we had a good connection. We list the document, the databases. Then we use one of those databases to list the collections. Now we can use that collection. We're saying, OK, for each collection, let's see what kind of documents are there. And so, yep, yeah, I'm using a slice of uh, empty interface. And so I say I want everything. That's why I pass nil to find. It returns me a query. And on that query, I say all. So this is a fluid API where you just keep chaining things together. I personally don't like it too much. But for this ex these example, I'm going to let it slide. And then I iterate over each document, and I print out the document. So let's take a look. So. Let's run that. And again, we have to specify which document we want. And you can see we collect to our collection, our database to do's. We have our task collection. And within our task collection, we have two documents. And we can certainly get more information by doing something like, let's do this, for example. And um, we should get a Golang appropriate version of what's going on. And as you can see, here is our ID, and it says that it's object ID X, and this is the value of it, okay? And um, we don't remember what this is, but basically it was when we inserted document, we said, uh, MongoDB, you give them uh, unique IDs. And so that's what it did, and this is what it looked like. Okay, so now we can get some stuff, and you can see we have description, you know, get milk, we also have our done flag that tell us whether you know it's done or not. All right, so so let's continue. Uh, now we will want to remember this object ID X, but anyway, let's see. Um, let's go back. So what change? Well, um, not much. So we went from having an empty interface to saying that oh, we have a slice of map of string to an interface. 
that map to string of empty interface is actually, this is the exact same thing in the code as if you had done um, a slice of package bison that m right that's exactly what it is. so this bison that m is defined to be a map of string of empty interfaces so that's essentially what you have so just i'm not using their thing and then i should iterate over it again so uh, we went from having a slice of empty interfaces to a little bit more structure by saying we have a map right whereas before we just simply said we had a slice of interface of empty interface elements and so let's run that and see what that looks like and it doesn't look much different, right? Um, because when we had the slice of interfaces, it sort of pulled out that oh, we were using the BSON, that M object anywhere, anyway. And here we actually saying that oh, we're using a map of a string of blah, blah, blah. I know I seem to be beating that to death, but I'm getting to something. That's why um, I'm trying to work my way up and show you. Okay, so again, we're trying to discover. So. What about if we use a structure instead? So let's look at this example. And what I'm doing is using a struct as the, to represent a document in my database or in my collection. And well, that's also true that's in my database. And so I would like to use a slice of document and a document is just this type. And so I have an ID and if you don't know, we can do things like use the tag field or a tag, a structure tag, to give some more information to the reflection package that's going to be using these fields to copy um, things. So the package you can imagine is going to say, well, okay, you have a field call done, and you said that our, oh, done field in the doc in the database can be the value there can be mapped to this done field in the struct. Okay, so since you want to use document objects, how do I map? from your struct fields to what I know. Because notice in the database, we're using lowercase done as the field name, whereas here we have to use uppercase because that package need to get into our you know, our value. And so we have to export it with by making it public. Okay, it, hopefully that makes sense. But it's just like when we did the JSON encoding, if you haven't seen that video yet, check it out why we need to use uppercase. So anyway, so I did the struct tags. So let's see if that can work. So let's go here, run the code. And as you can see, no, it doesn't work. So um, let's do a little bit more digging, but at least we are able to get the other fields correctly. Right, our description field or done field, they all got loaded correctly because we utilize this struct field tags. Okay, let's keep going. And so now, since I notice that um, that ID field is not really quite an integer, but when I use map of string to interface, well, yeah, um, you know, feels like my Boolean field was actually a Boolean, but um, that ID field was some object called, you know, object X or something like that uh, from the BSON package. So I want to see if I can get it as a string. If I can get it as a string, then I can cast that so I can look up in my document. If everything is just string, right? String to string. I can look up that field, that, um, use that value using the key underscore ID and then convert it to an object ID from this Bison package. And I suggest you go do a bit of reading on this package, but basically you can think of it as a sub package of MGO, okay? So again, if you go over here and just go, you type, uh, so you go to the homepage, you type MGO, and the one we want is, so you can, do this, read this, but really, um, BSON, we're using signal, global sign, sorry, global sign. So you can go read up on all that stuff. And you see, they have a D and M object. And this is why I mentioned that it's a map of slice of interface. And there's also this object ID, which uh, talks about how Mongo uses this as 
the ID for objects, which is using that underscore ID field, which is exactly what we have. So, but if you look at object ID, it's just type defined as a string, okay? And then um, there's this function called object ID X, which is what looks like got called for us and um, return um, that value. So let's see, um, I hope this makes sense. So since I see that that thing look like a string, that an underscore ID look like a string, I'll try to use that, but I don't change my um, document object. Instead, I just create a literal type here. And let's see if that works. So this is example seven. So let's go and run that. And you can see that, yes, when I have the map of string of strings, I do get back that ID, of course, is a key. And there it is. There's my value as a string. It's there. Um, it's some sort of encoded thing, but it's still there. And um, what I'd like to be able to do, and so if you look at the code that I write, I wrote here, is to take this thing, that string, cast it to this object ID, which is in this BSON package, because I went and showed you just now that it says that MongoDB uses this object ID as this field. So that's when you don't specify your own ID, right? And so I try to get it as an hexadecimal value. Um, it's X representation, encoded representation, um, string, and then the time. And so if you go back, you'll see that that is what it looked like when we encoded it. When we did an insert on the command line, the Mongo shell, we got back that our document had some ID like this, which is why I'm not surprised that when we tried to use it as an int, it was zero because this is more like a hash value sort of like. And um, when we get to the string, well, it tells us, well, object ID X, you know, is this query thing. But then look at it, when we ask to get it as a time, this is when we inserted those records. So it's, this is the time. So you can use that to get the time when that document was inserted. So you can know if you, between two documents, which one is older and so on. And if you remember that there's also a way for um, MongoDB to keep track of versions. So if we modify a document, there should be an underscore version field, but we haven't modified it. So there's no version field, but that's going to be another thing that you can also look at. All right. So that's promising. It's promising because we are able to cast this value, whatever that string was, to a BSON object ID. And so you would think, now that we know that this ID is a BSON object, so I thought that um, this would work, that I can simply just say that my type is not a string, but even if it was a string, then at least I can do this conversion that we did in the previous example. For example, seven, if you remember, we said, okay, we know that it's a string, so we converted it ourselves to based on object ID. Well, even if I could put string here and it worked, but this is just type defined as a string anyway, so that's fine, but it doesn't work. And so let me just run this code and show you. And so what I do is I just guard against if I try to um, use a this field, if it's empty or not. Um, because I want to try and call this on this object to call the X method or the string. And then if it's empty, my program actually crashes. So um, I want to protect myself against that. So let's run this code. And you can see that when I use bson that object ID, I get back an empty string. And that is sort of puzzling to me because when we use map string of string, or even map of string, it does not give me back an empty string. I can understand when I use an int why it should be zero. It doesn't know how to convert that thing to an int, but why not a string? Why not give me the string representation? And I looked at their example code and it's not clear to me how, so why it's working that way. Here's some examples. If you want to learn how to use this, do some of the basic things I've been doing like the find and so on. I didn't show you example for create because it's very straightforward. But if you figure out oh, what type you have to specify here within your own structure so that you can have it properly m map out that object ID, I'll be interested to know. So if you fool around with it and you get it to work, then great. All right. So that's it. I just would like to hear back from someone who get this to work. Thanks for your time. Bye.